I'm very happy that we have Tina Anderson here with us today, who will share her knowledge with us on how to best use mechanical index deflations for patients with ALS. Tina Anderson works at the Haukland University Hospital in Bergen, Norway. She's a physiotherapist with a special interest in non-invasive respiratory support in neuromuscular diseases. She's part of the Bergen ILO Research Group, where she has pioneered research on the upper airway and its response to mechanical inexufflation, both in healthy subjects as well as in individuals with uh, ALS. I'm delighted that she will talk on this topic with us here today. So welcome, Tina, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Carl, for a nice introduction. And I want to thank Breas to, for invitation to have this speech about, the, about this topic. Uh, I will uh, share my uh, presentation. There we have it. And yes, we this, yes, thank you. So how to use uh, MYE, mechanical lens reflation, next reflation in ALS. And this is one of my favorite topics. Uh, it's not favorite topics because it's easy, but it's because it's challenging and uh, we can uh, definitely not say that it's contraindicated in ALS. We just need to know how to do it. Um, and since this is a challenging uh, group of patients to treat with MIE, I want first to show you uh, some user experiences. Um, Vivian. She is uh, 42 years old. She's living with the diagnosis of ALS. She got it five, six years ago. Uh, it started as a spinal type of ALS. Uh, she has now big bulbar uh, symptoms and she is not able to speak anymore. So she has written uh, her experiences with MIE to us. <clears throat> So she was introduced to MIE uh, at the hospital uh, when she was uh, inpatient uh, with pneumonia and she found that as a horrible experience. And uh, she didn't have that much energy because she had this pneumonia and when we used MIE on her, she panicked. She felt that we forced the device on her, but she couldn't cough by herself. So, so the device needed to get her lungs to work to get this mucus up and she felt that it felt like the lungs burned inside her. But and she didn't have tried this device before and it was very difficult to be introduced to that during that hospitalization. But even worse was that all the mucus that stuck in her throat and she had, had never greater feeling of suffocation than then. And it wasn't easy to get mucus up with MIE. So we needed to vary the strength of the cough program from day to day, uh, depending what she tolerated and, and needed. But we managed to get the mucus up and um, she got better. And before she traveled home, she got the device with her with new settings. And she managed to use this in, in chronic state without any acute infections. Um, but after a year, she got problems again. The slightest cough with the device led to retching and she got very tired after just a few coughs. And we decided to use laryngoscopy during MIE maneuvers with different settings, with different devices to find out what was best for her. And we saw that there, is, there was lots of closure and uh, something was more important than other settings. And we tailored her home treatment again, especially based on that uh, examination. She didn't get any retching anymore and she could have several coughs in a row and she didn't become any more tired. And she was very relieved that she had a help to cough up her mucus again. So this group of patients is very challenging and it's uh, due to the uh, fact that ALS is very heterogenic uh, disease. It's very difficult to find two absolutely similar patients with same symptoms, same neurology, same disease progression and same affection uh, of uh, respiration. So this diagnosis uh, itself, it 
uh, it needs um, both uh, symptoms or affection of both upper and lower motor neurons before you can get the diagnosis of ALS. Um, we often define that it's more predominantly upper uh, motor neuron affection or more predominantly lower motor neuron affection. It can start by as a spinal onset, that means that it starts from fingers and feet or as a bulbar onset. And how rapidly it evolves, it's uh, very individual. In some it, it go very fast and in some it, it takes a uh, longer time. And respiration is always affected and in which phase and how badly it's also very individually variated. So that's why uh, we need to treat these patients um, individually. And non-invasive ventilation has become the standard of care for respiratory support in patients with ALS. And cough engines are recommended for ALS patients with ineffective cough who report difficulty in clearing secretions. If patients cannot cough and we don't treat them, this is associated with marked excess mortality. This study was a retrospective uh, a study from Kamankar and his colleagues who reported uh, almost 500 patients who had used uh, uh, MIE, um, now MIE together with NIV or only with one device or uh, neither device. And they reported very much higher survival when both NIV and daily MIE was used. MIE is not the only device or only uh, cough augmentation technique we can use in ALS. Uh, this study uh, from um, uh, Paris uh, compared several cough augmentation techniques and uh, concluded that if we take in consideration the uh, increase of peak of flow and patient subjective evaluation of efficacy, we should have MIE as a first choice, both for bulbar and non-bulbar patients. Um, uh, this is the first study uh, from UK, Mustafa et al, who saw mechanical insufflation, exufflation in, in ALS patients, both bulbar and non-bulbar patients. And they saw that the peak of flow is, is uh, increased in both groups, but much more in non-bulbar patients. Um, and Jesus Sancho from Valencia in Spain, he has published several studies uh, studying MIE in ALS. Um, and they were uh, able to detect a peak of low cutoff point uh, of 2.95 liter per second, that it's almost 108 liters per minute, to be predictor uh, effectiveness of uh, FMIE. So both NIV and MIE are beneficial in ALS, but they are often challenging in patients with bulbar symptoms. So what is this bulbar function or bulbar symptoms? So bulbar is a Latin term for brainstem. And muscles of pharynx, larynx, jaw, tongue and mouth, they are innervated from this bulbar area in the brain. And function difficulties like speech difficulties, chewing, swallowing, and cough difficulties, we often use a term called bulbar dysfunction. But more precise definition for this is bulbar innervated muscle dysfunction. And in bulbar ALS patients, their respiration will be affected more early than in patients with spinal ALS variant. And they will have lowering, a loss of laryngeal control during meals. They will have coughing aspirations when they are eating and drinking, a loss of voice and speech and cough function, and also gradual loss of respiration capacity. And what is the clinical effect of MIE in ALS? That is, a, there is a big variation. So this first patient here, he, um, he ha he's a male with uh, spinal uh, ALS onset and no bulbar symptoms. He has very weak muscles in his body, but uh, MIE helps him to cough up the secretions. The second patient is a female with bulbar onset ALS, a 
peak saliva problem in addition to mucus problem and MIE is just very uncomfortable for her. So what is successful use of the MIE? I want us to reflect a little bit uh, about this. We wish to increase peak of flow because we know that it's an indicator to improve the patient's ability to cough and clear the airway secretions and mucus plugs. We can also measure the time we use to chest physiotherapy in these patients. This is probably better um, to use in the hospitalized patients like Michelle Chatwin used in one of her uh, studies. Um, the aim of the treatment is to treat and prevent pulmonary complications and to have first a period to let patients to have these complications and then start MIE and measure if it gets better. It's not ethical way to do it. Uh, uh, not in our country at least where we can give these aids and uh, these treatments uh, to the patients. Uh, if the patient is a good candidate for tracheostomy, we, we know that we can prevent and delay this need if we can remove the mucus uh, uh, effectively. And if patients have been uh, intubated or have been uh, have, uh, tracheostomy, it's easier to decannulate them if we can use successful uh, successfully the MIE. But these are like more my ideas or our uh, ideas as uh, respiratory physiotherapists, what is the successful use of MIE. We need more qualitative studies to also detect and define what is patients' impressions of what is successful use. Uh, this is a study from a colleague here in Oslo, Norway, who performed the qualitative interviews with patients with ALS and their caregivers and find out that the MIE daily use is uh, quite individualized. They use MIE device very differently. And some patients, they report regular use. They use it like this male patient every morning in the middle of the day and in the evening. And he doesn't always cough up mucus, but usually on the mornings, it's very, very effective. Uh, another patient uh, says that it's difficult to establish routines. They know that they should use it um, daily, but like him, he has problems with gas in the stomach and the pain is, is higher if they use a MIE device in, in, when, he, when he suffers from that. So it, he knows it could be beneficial to use it three times a day uh, or when the assistance shifts are there, two assistants, but this is uh, not uh, how it's uh, uh, done. When I ask Vivian, who you already have met, how, what, how, how do you describe the effect of this MIE treatment for you? She said that that gives her security to confidence to live her life like she wants. So if she get the mucus plug that is really, really um, horrible for him, he panics. So just to know she have a device, a treatment and can help her like a first aid, uh, it gives her security. Of course, it uh, restricts her life. She needs to bring the device with her. But on the other hand, she don't feel she is restricted to be in her home, but she can move around and enjoy life. And also she used that as a preventive first aid. So before she goes out, be with her kids, family, friends, she used a uh, MIE device to, to be get, quit, um, remove the secretion she has. So she won't uh, she don't want to think how the life would be without to have that security. So with all this, we know that MIE should be effective to clear the secretions, uh, help patients to cough and, and so on. And in some studies, we have seen that if you increase the pressures, treatment pressures, it increase more peak of flow, for instance. But it's at least important that it's tolerated by the patient. So it should be comfortable 
and it should maintain upper airway patency and it should be safe. And to um, aim this, we need to have individualized and patient-centered approach. When we start to detract the settings, uh, Michelle Chatwin has wrote a really, really beautiful paper about how they do it in, in London. And our way to do it is, is very similar. Uh, we also evaluate how uh, much my patient wants and can participate active to this treatment. With other neuromuscular disorders, we often uh, think that the peak of flow below 180 liters per minute is an indication to get an MIE device at home. But in ALS, especially if they experience mucus problems, we use peak of flow values 270 liters per minute because the disease is progressing much, much uh, faster. If patients have NIV only on the night time or not at all, we know that they have spontaneous inspiration. They can trigger the insufflations and we can use patients' spontaneous inspiration and we can just assist uh, that to get to the, achieve the deep uh, inspiration we want. If the patient can perform a cough sound or if we ask them to repeat E, 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 this um, uh, indicates that they can addict their uh, vocal folds and um, perform glottic closure and opening during cough. And that also means that we can instruct these patients to cough with the device, not just being passive. And if patient gets uh, infection, either pulmonary infection or other infection, they are much more tired, uh, don't have the same strength, they need more support. Patients uh, often need secondary program that they can change to uh, during these uh, uh, resonance. And in ALS, I think it's the, the same way to titrate the settings as in other neuromuscular uh, disorders. The insufflation should aim to give a sufficient volume uh, prior to cough up, uh, out. And during exufflation, we we wish to increase the airflow and we will titrate the settings in, in, in patients first meeting with MIE to get a good rise and fall in chest wall and abdomen and the patient feels that they get a good breath in. It's an important question in ALS and also observe the volumes from the device screen and um, if, if we manage to, to do that, um, the treatment without masculates. And if we hear that cough is, is um, better, if we see, if we feel the secretions are coming up and the patient feels that the cough is stronger and we observe higher peak of low volumes, it's a good indication to us that we are on, on the right way. We can also evaluate and assess and visualize the upper airways during MIE treatment. And the way we do it is with transnasal fiber optic laryngoscopy. That is a thin, thin catheter with a very good video camera and light source in the end. Uh, we have modified the masks, made small holes to the mask and we go first, scope goes through them, then we find the nose and uh, slide the laryngoscope on there um, through, through the nose and we stop just behind the thumb, we don't go lower than uh, that. And for those who are not familiar how the upper airways looks with these techniques, I have made a small crash course in laryngeal anatomy. So this is a top view. This is the view we get with the laryngoscopy. And this um, uh, in the middle here, the dark, darkest place is the trachea and uh, the white uh, strings here, they are the true vocal folds. And a little bit higher up, we have area epiglottic folds. That is um, when we close the glottis, like in the second picture, area epiglottic folds helps true vocal folds to close the glottis um, uh, if needed. Epiglottis, it's lying against uh, the tongue base. If, if we are swallowing, it will cover uh, the trachea. And these bumps here down, they are base of the tongue and the whole room uh, around the larynx, uh, above larynx, it's called hyperpharynx. 
And when we describe the movements and the responses we, we see with laryngoscopy, we often say what happens, describes what happens at the level of true vocal folds, on the glottic level, and what happens at the supraglottic level, that is a level of arabic glottic folds. What happens with the base of the tongue? What happens with the epiglottis? And what happens in this hyperpharyngeal room? And it's lots of closure in larynx, and it's because of the origin, original use of, of larynx was to keep us alive through breakfast. It was to protect lungs, uh, to stop solids and liquids uh, from entering the trachea and choking uh, us to death when we were eating. That was the main function, and it still is it. And the secondary functions, it's to allow airflow during respiration, phonation and, and cough. That is more like openings and closures uh, at the laryngeal level. <clears throat> Sorry. We have published uh, a few papers during the last uh, years how to visualize the upper airways and also describe the findings uh, from these examinations. And we started first to examine healthy subjects. And that was really important for our understanding what was different in ALS. First, state what was normal, and then we could uh, try to compare these um, examinations in ALS with those previous findings. So what is normal? That was real time. It's really, really fast. Now I have made it in slow motion. During insufflation, we have an opening in, uh, in our larynx. When we ask participants to cough, they manage to coordinate the pressure drop. And often exufflation phase, it's openings and closures, openings and closures as in normal cough. This is also normal. Retroflex movement of the epiglottis during positive pressures. It can be very fast, cover very fast and come back, or like here, stay for whole insufflation phase. And in healthy, healthy individuals, we found that with high pressures of plus 50, it, almost half of them had this. So this is normal as well. This is also healthy persons. The hyperpharyngeal room is really constricted during the exufflation. And in pressures of minus 40, half of them had it. And pressures of 50, 75% of healthy individuals have this response during exufflation. And this was probably the same uh, Jesus Samso saw when he performed a very um, innovative CT scan of the upper airways uh, in uh, three of his ALS patients. They had a hypothesis that uh, bulbar ALS patients didn't manage to increase their peak of flow because they got a, this uh, obstruction during exufflation. So they took CT scans during baseline when nothing happened and also during the negative pressures. And they saw that the bulbar ALS patients with very weak cough had much bigger reduction in airway diameter compared to the non bulbar ALS patient with the weak cough. If they had uh, examined the insufflation phase, they probably have seen that it was also problematic because this was our finding with laryngoscopy in bulbar ALS patients. When we apply the positive pressures here, the larynx is closing predominantly at the supraglottic level. And when we change to the exufflation, it opens. However, it's quite constricted, quite narrowed, because we didn't get enough air initially during insufflation. And this happened in our first bulbar ALS patient we examined. It happened in second, in third, and fourth, fifth, sixth, in all bulbar ALS patients we examined in our cross-sectional study. And it happened either at once we applied insufflation or during the two seconds of insufflation we, we used. And this finding was significantly different from non-bulbar patients and uh, healthy controls. We also followed up our patients up to five years with these examinations in a longitudinal cohort. And we uh, observed 
do we see these responses also in spinal onset patients? What happens with them? And in disease progression, the spinal onset patients also evolve the same reaction, the closure during insufflation, and especially on the high treatment pressures of plus 40 and plus 50. With lower pressures, some of them were able to keep their upper airways longer open during insufflation. This is preliminary results. Um, we also measured uh, airflow um, and registered the waveforms of uh, flow uh, during these visualizations. And we saw that if it's open, the air flows into the airs. Uh, in the airways and during exsufflation, of course, during closures, there is reduction in flow, but the flow can va uh, vary uh, quite long time during the exsufflation phase. If there was a closure uh, visually, we also saw that there was a restriction in uh, airflow waveform. And then we also try to find out what happens first. Uh, and we find out that that this insufflation closure is the first bulbar symptom in ALS patients. It happens before patients report other clinical bulbar symptoms like reduced wallowing or reduced speech. And this narrowing during exsufflation, it happens always after patients have had a closure during insufflation. So if we don't get air in to the lungs, it's impossible to get it out and it creates a vacuum. It, there is no air to exsufflate. <clears throat> so the cough evolves and also these laryngeal responses to MIE evolves in ALS. This is two videos from the same patient, but 15 months between them. In the first film, it was 15 months after he got uh, ALS bulbar symptom. Uh, she, he didn't have any bulbar symptoms and he managed still or used uh, MIE device. 15 months later, he had evolved bulbar symptoms. He had lower motor neuron uh, affection predominantly with progressive bulbar palsy and his laryngeal responses was like uh, initially patient with bulbar onset. Um, a study group of speech therapists in Florida, led by amazing Emily Plowman there, uh, has done also research uh, to evaluate cough quality and try to link it uh, to swallowing and, and speech. And this paper has the first, is from that group with first author of Lauren Tabor Gray, and where they registered it just spontaneously, uh, spontaneous coughing by healthy and ALS with spinal onset and bulbar onset. And they saw that in ALS, the inspiratory phase of spontaneous cough is prolonged and had a reduced peak flow rate. The exsufflation, uh, expiratory um, phase, the expiratory rise time is increased and they create lower peak flow rates. So ALS patients spontaneously cough differently than healthy and also probably uh, compared to other neuromuscular disorders. And based on these findings, we have suggested that we should uh, use MIE differently in ALS patients. Um, especially the insufflation settings is something we should be aware of. So if patient is able to trigger, we might, it would might be beneficial to try if that can help. Because of um, the only abducting muscle in the larynx, PCA muscle, and diaphragm, they have a so-called phasic relationship. That means that when we activate our diaphragm, the PCA muscle uh, opens the larynx. And that creates better conditions uh, for airflow to come into the lungs. It can also uh, increase synchronization with, um, between device and patient. So patient can decide by themselves when the insufflation starts. However, some of the patients triggers this too easily. 
So if we have a device, uh, as ClearWay, for instance, where we can change uh, sensibility, sensitivity of triggering, so we can increase that and see if the patient is able to, to trigger and synchronize better. If they don't, if they trick too easily, the in next insufflation probably comes too quickly and it can again create some trouble. What is very important point in these patients is to decrease the inspiratory flow, meaning insufflation flow is insufflation rise time. So it's the time that uh, takes to achieve the insufflation pressure we have set. In high flow, uh, that means quick rise time. The pressure is achieved very rapidly by the device. And in low flow, there is slow rise time and device um, in, uh, achieves the treatment pressure very, very late, maybe during the whole insufflation phase. And that is better for our upper airways and larynx that is ready to, to the closure, to protect the lungs. If uh, pressure comes to, uh, to um, uh, rapidly, uh, the closure happens. If we can use a longer rise time and use longer time to achieve the treatment pressure, the larynx may tolerate that better. It can also be beneficial for the mucus movement if we um, um, decrease the insufflation flow, but we still achieve a high expiratory flow, this will uh, uh, result as a higher expiratory flow bias. So the flow out is higher than flow in, and this can more effective move uh, secretions uh, in, at least in the lung model, shown by um, Marcia Volpe from Brazil. Okay, so the next point is to decrease inspiratory pressures. Uh, this is same patient, same examination. The biggest difference here is the insufflation pressure. In the first picture, we used 40 positive pressure and in second, plus 20. And when it was 40, it was impossible to get air into the lungs. But when it was 20, we managed to keep uh, an opening and insufflate the lungs. Um, this is from studies from Michelle Chatwin, who described how their patients are using MIE in home use. And they are using this approach in ALS, but also in other neuromuscular disorders, uh, providing higher exsufflation pressures than insufflation pressures. But okay, now imagine if we have decreased the inspiratory pressures, we have in, uh, increased the rise times, um, so we might may also or we must also ensure that we get uh, we can deliver a sufficient insufflation volume. It's important for effective cough. So we might need increased inspiratory time to just use longer time with these more careful uh, pressures and insufflation flows uh, to achieve uh, a good uh, lung failing. Um, ALS patients in the disease progression, as you saw in a previous uh, movie, so cough is altered in ALS and it's less expulsive, it takes more time, it's not that synchronized at the laryngeal level. And these patients with ALS, they also might start to swallow when they should cough. And um, uh, this, this can be triggered for instance, by the retroflex movement of the epiglottis, because that's the way swallowing starts. And these rapid MIE cycles, what we are used to give in patients with other neuromuscular uh, diseases, and they like it and they get a very good effect of it, this can be very challenging or impossible for these patients with slower cough. So if patients start to swallow, if you observe that, you should just take a small break with MIE, wait that the reflexes are, are done, and then we can try again with the next insufflation. Uh, it can be beneficial to increase the time interval between exsufflation and next insufflation, and uh, also think that one cough cycle successful is better 
than several cough cycles that are bad. bad. So try to uh, evaluate how your patient is coughing spontaneously. And can we try to tailor uh, the MIE settings more closely to that? Exoflation phase, we haven't uh, talked about that yet, uh, but these patients, um, uh, it looks like that somebody, some of the patients have longer, uh, need for longer exoflation, and some patients have need for very short uh, exoflation time. Um, of course, we can measure that if we have a pneumotocograph, we can add the, the circuit and observe the waveforms, or we can use stethoscope and use it as a cervical auscultation here on the throat on the side and try to make a picture how my patient is coughing. Is it a very short phase during exoflation they need or do they need a longer exoflation? Uh, group of uh, Mathieu Lacombe from Paris, they registered also again, exoflation waveforms from several neuromuscular patients. And they also calculated something called effective cough volume. That is the volume above the flow three, three liters per second uh, that patient is exoflating. And they saw that this effective cough volume is related to the upper airway closure uh, during exoflation. Uh, be aware of the patient's neck and jaw position. We don't want to make the pharyngeal place, uh, pharyngeal room that is behind the tongue, a little bit higher up than larynx. We don't want to obstruct that. And if we push the jaw inwards uh, by pushing the mask uh, very tightly uh, on, on the jaw, we can obstruct patient's uh, upper airways and make it impossible uh, to attempt to use uh, MIE with uh, success. If you keep your teeth apart, you will have an open glottis open uh, true vocal folds. So if patients have a problem at the vocal vo fold level, it can help to have a small uh, mouthpiece between their teeth under the mask. It can help them to keep the glottic level open. This is a patient with upper motor neuron uh, ALS, predominantly very spastic. He had spasticity in his whole body. And he and his caregivers noticed that when they try to reduce the general spasticity in the body just before they use MIE, the efficacy of the MIE is much better. So here the treatment is individualized for their uh, practical uh, experiences uh, with him. So, our clinical experiences of, of these points is that if we use lower insufflation flow, longer rise time, the conditions in the larynx is more stable. If we reduce the insufflation pressure compared to exufflation pressure, at least some cough cycles, if not all, have better opening in, in the larynx level. If we use longer break between exufflation and next exufflation, or one cough cycle at a time, the patients often get uh, synchronized their cough better with uh, MIE, and um, uh, especially in the case of retroflex epiglottic movement. If patients are able to trigger the insufflations, the, we can use the basic relationship between the diaphragm and abduction in the larynx, unless if they trigger that too easily, uh, then uh, it makes uh, just trouble. <laughs> And have you noticed the athletes when they come to, to the goal and they are very often exhausted, they are leaning their body in forward position and breathing heavily. It's because this position abducts the larynx. So in some patients, it's more beneficial that they are sitting uh, near the table and leaning to their elbows and leaning forward when they, they use the MIE treatment.
Oscillations, we haven't talked about those either yet, but when we have observed uh, the larynx, uh, there is lots of laryngeal movement, both opening and closing. And if the alternative with, without oscillation is totally closure, and openings and closures with oscillations, we choose to use them. This is also uh, examined the oscillations if they increase the peak of flow um, more and they couldn't see that. So it's not to, uh, in that case to increase the peak of flow, but it's to keep uh, provide some opening uh, in larynx. And this examination of uh, transnasal fiber optic laryngoscopy during MIE, it can guide us, in, it can help us to make some choices, see what is not possible for this patient and what is more beneficial. And it does not necessarily need to be in laboratory examination. There is also portable uh, scopes with uh, portable screens that we can take uh, bedside and we can visualize the larynx uh, during these maneuvers and make adjustments uh, in the settings. It, this also helps us to detect if there is some saliva retention. Uh, this is a case study uh, from Allen, Jody Allen from UK, uh, who this is not ALS patient, but it's some similar problems. They started MIE uh, to treat uh, patients with pneumonia, but it didn't help. <laughs> and when they visualized the upper airways with laryngoscopy, they observed that there was a, a big amount of saliva retention in, in, uh, in larynx. And after MIE use, it was gone. But video fluoroscopy uh, detected that this saliva retention was blown to the lungs. And that was probably causing the aspiration pneumonia. And this is something we see often in some patients. They have lots of saliva retention. And when we use these therapeutic uh, pressures, we may blow them uh, down. Few ALS patients may have more beneficial to use air stacking or breath stacking instead of MIE. That means that we use amber bags, and in this case, uh, we have put the one-way valve to the circuit, so we just pump the patients up, and then we combine that with manually assisted cough, and uh, can help some of the patients uh, cough more effectively. Um, this study described uh, differences uh, in survival in patients who used MIE or breath stacking. And in this study, the patients who had severely impaired pulbar function, they um, managed um, to survive longer with breath stacking compared to MIE. But the uh, authors said it's, uh, we cannot make any conclusions on six patients with uh, severely impaired pulbar function who, who survived better with uh, breath stacking. This recent study described uh, from the UK, one year cohort with ALS, who got MIE, who got breath stacking. And uh, it looks like that the patients who got breath stacking, they were stronger, they had higher peak of flows, and they well, wasn't that uh, developed in their disease uh, progression yet. So these respiratory technical equipments like MIE, they are a little bit magical, but they are not just magical. There are tools for us to use and we can use everything both incorrectly and suboptimal. It is how we use the equipment and how we instruct and teach the patient and their caregivers to use the equipment that is treatment. So in ALS one size does not fit all. They, these patients need tailored, individualized and fine-tuned uh, treatment. Michel Toussaint, a good colleague from Brussels, already 10 years ago, he wrote that time has come to fine tune the insufflation, exufflation indications and settings depending on the patient characteristics rather than further demonstrate the insufflation, exufflation effectiveness. So if we don't use these devices on optimal right way, it of course will affect the effect studies. So we first need to find out how to do it on the best way, and then we can perform more effectiveness studies. Uh, 
very well known uh, ALS pulmonologist Noah Lechting from United States. He uh, quoted uh, US Marines uh, who are looking for a few good men to keep them flying. In the same manner, he is recruiting a few good pulmonologists to treat patients with ALS. Inspired by that, we are looking for skilled and creative physiotherapists to tailor and individualize the cough augmentation for individuals with ALS. I can promise the work is not easy, and sometimes we need to make some uh, uh, difficult things to, to um, come to the goal, and we must not um, uh, think that we, we cannot help these patients. We just uh, need to try. Jean-Martin Jacot, in 1889, he wrote, let us keep looking in spite of everything. Let us keep searching. It's indeed the best method for finding, and perhaps thanks to our efforts, the verdict we give such a patient tomorrow will not be the same we must give this man today. He was the one to describe the association between symptoms and neurological underlying problems in ALS, and his words still lives today. We need to keep looking and searching. Maybe we can help patients differently tomorrow than today. I want to thank all my patients uh, during two decades. I have learned uh, everything from you and your caregivers and I want to thank you for the attention. I have also promised to tell you that next Tebrea's education will be in one month, Thursday 28th of April with Dr. Debbie Field, a specialist uh, nurse in complex ventilation, tracheostomy and weaning at Royal Prompton. Uh, hospital in London. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. very much, Tina. Um, amazing presentation as always. We have a couple of questions here on the chat and I invite everybody who is here on the webinar to keep on posting. Um, let's just take them top to bottom. There is a question, which do you have more consideration for when titrating MIE settings for a patient to choose out of the inspiratory flow, the time or the pressure? Oh, I'm, I must choose. <laughs> oh. I would say like we need to prove. I, 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 I take them all. <laughs> Um, it's uh, well, we often uh, start at least now we start with ins insufflation flow. We start very low um, with the longest rise time. And then we titrate the pressure settings upwards and see how long we, we uh, can come. And depending uh, how big volumes we get, uh, how the chest is moving for the patient, if there is uh, thoracic elasticity left, we try to find out a time they are um, uh, able to, to coordinate the cough with. Great, great. Um, more and more here coming in all the time. Um, in your opinion, should patients with severe bulbar dysfunction perform the expiratory phase with an abdominal thrust recommended or just apply the expiratory pressure? OK, so if we should use also manually assisted cough. Yes, yeah, yeah we, we do that. But of course, it's not always possible in the patient's home if they have um, uh, nutrition uh, through the peg. It can be difficult to do that if patients have pain. Um, so we, we individualize. If, if they like it and it's uh, possible to do, we do that. And I, of course, do that when, if I'm treating a hospitalized patient, I, I will always do that in combination. Yeah, uh, we are lucky to also have Michelle Chatwin uh, on the call. So, Michelle, if you uh, want to add or have any additional comments or questions, please feel free to drop them. I, I will do and I, I agree with Tina so, so far. She's an excellent clinician, so I, it, it was a wonderful talk. Um, 
before I ask some of my questions, because we've got quite a few coming in, um, Vivian asks, please clarify thoughts on progressive weakness in vulva patients and adjustment of pressure. Are the thoughts that lower pressures, uh, should we lower the pressure as the patients become weaker? Yes, that's a good question, because if you think the patient is getting weaker, they might need more support. I think that's, that's a balance. What's effective and what do they tolerate? Uh, so they might need, might need maybe two programs or three programs which they can vary uh, due to that to get the mucus up, but still have that feeling that it's, it's comfortable and it's keeping the upper airways open. How, how's your experience with that, Michelle? It's a really interesting point because ultimately you think the weaker the patient, the higher the pressures, and we tend to just drive up the pressure in other neuromuscular diseases rather than actually take the bulbar ALS patients or the ALS patients and think about them in a completely different way. I mean, what's interesting is that we were able to continue MIE in lots of patients before your research came out without having horrific problems because I know that at the start before you identified decreasing the rise time basically dropping the inflation pressure increasing the TI um, we managed but then we would sort of find that patients were so bulbar that we ended up just using a yanka sucker at the back of their throat and they actually cleared secretions quite well mm. and then we went on to take on board your advice and the publications that you did and we, we did find that we could manage patients longer but I think looking back at things dropping the pressure was as they got weaker was something that we never did so so that is a really interesting point and perhaps further research can come out in that area, which is great that people are thinking about it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the next um, question, um, the person apologises that they might have been a little bit late and, and missed it, but how do you work out how many cough cycles to prescribe? Do you choose a breath in first, like a thoracic expansion exercise? Um, so do you do a sequence of breath in, breath in, breath in, breath in and cough. Or um, I know that we, we did talk about that looking at the quality of the cough and hearing whether the larynx is getting tired and whether it's just closing, whether you just do the one breath. So I think, could you comment on that? And um, <laughs> whether because of this larynx being tired, actually using repeated insufflations because that will stimulate the upper airway is not such a good idea in this group of patients compared to others? Yeah, I think it's really individual. You need to try try that out with your patient. And it, if, even if they prefer first, when you meet them, um, these insufflations repeated before you go to insufflation, exufflation, it might be different in three months. So I, I think I, I would ask my patient what do they prefer but give them not too many options at once when they are getting knowing with the treatment keep it a little bit simple but afterwards they become experts in this and we becomes the assistants that can just suggest how about this and how about that so i think it's really really difficult to have black and white answers here uh, other than just the uh, answer, uh, it, it should be individualized. But yes, we have patients, somebody likes this repeated insufflations. It's like they come to the mode and often with lower pressures than you will use in, in, uh, in the augmentation of uh, cough. And I mean, I just picked up on you. We know that ALS is much more progressive than standard neuromuscular disorders. So what would be your ideal time interval for following these patients up? Because we've got the burden of bringing them to a hospital, which they don't like. We've talked about providing the device early, 
because of the rapid progression. So we've got the, you provide it early, they don't need it, it gets left in the cupboard, they forget to use it. And then, as you've said, we've got to make adaptions as soon as they really do need it for, mm. to accommodate the disease progression. So how, how do you deal with that? We deal with that, that they are coming to the hospital every three months. And in the meanwhile, if they need us, if they uh, if they feel that, OK, it's not helping me anymore. Now I have got problems. They contact us. Sometimes just a telephone call with the wife or husband or caregiver can give some ideas. Uh, they can try uh, when they come next time. But we also perform home visits uh during the consultations if needed and if it when it becomes too hard to come to the hospital we often follow the patients at home so it's not that strict it's every three months and picking back up on that point another question from the audience is that what do you do when and I've had this as well, when patients have too many secretions and then they start to feel that MIE is sort of counterproductive and so they stop using it because they almost like suffocate with all the, the loose secretions. So how would you deal with that? Yeah, it is very tricky. Uh, a good question again. Um, one thing we haven't been speaking today it's about the saliva and secretion problem so it can be that it, it the saliva production increase and patients and of a physician as well they just think everything is secretions so if if the saliva is more and um, uh, production is more increased the patient are uh, drooling it will also drool uh, backwards so have a, a tight discussion with also the physicians and nurses, what do what do they think? Uh, can it be a saliva production that has increased? Maybe they need Botox uh, injections or um, some medications that can uh, dry the saliva production. But it's it's hard, definitely. I I don't have any <laughs> complete answer to that. And if if somebody has, I'm really interested to to hear that <laughs> as well. I mean, how how much do you use Botox? Because that's something that we've found has been quite difficult for access for some of the bulbar ALS patients. It's very much used in other neuromuscular disorders. But what you tend to find is people try hyacin patches to, to dry up the secretions or glycopyrrolate orally and then sublingual atropine drops. Um, and there sort of seems to be a let's try and see what we get. Um, how how, how do you know that? Yeah, well, we in, in our hospital, we have a, a multi-professional ALS clinic. So in, every every ALS day we have had, we gathered in, in a meeting and often discuss multi-professionally the patient, patients. And it's often, of course, neurologist who decides this patient needs uh, a Botox, but uh, we, we can we can come with our ideas and experiences and advices what we think it's important here and now. I don't have any numbers how many of how many patients got that and how often, but it's it's like patient tailored approach there as well. And I think I think that's a key thing with ALS patients. We need to have all of the disciplines in one area to manage them because Otherwise, if they've got to wait for someone else for a couple of weeks, that has a big impact on on their treatment program, their quality of life and ultimately how well we're managing them. So I think hats off to you. Really good setup that you've got. We've got a couple more questions. Um, the next one is can active contraction during MIE expiratory phase influence abdominal um, glottic? Ab sorry, I can't read today abnormal glottic movements you always get one person don't you okay so the uh, uh, closure during exuflation yeah can't. so yeah so if you ask them to have an active contraction oh. does that influence the abnormal glottic movement so should we be telling our patients to cough 
<laughs> with the device, or should we just let the device oh. passively? Thank you. Late. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question as well. And I think there is traditional differences between uh, countries and clinics and, and also clinicians. Uh, uh, we physiotherapists, we all, often want our patients active participatory treatment and many of them, it, they lose so many, many functions with the disease that what they can keep, what they can do active, it's important for their quality of life and mental health and I I often if I see they manage to to do the clotted closure I say please uh, cough actively with the treatment if they don't manage that it just get uh, troubles <laughs> we say okay don't care just be passive you just receive the air and let it out and it will um, change during the disease progression and if patient doesn't never get any pooper symptoms or very little they manage to cough uh, with MIE during the whole uh, disease progression. Mm. The last question before I ask you one final question that I want to know the answer to but this is from the audience thank you for affirming that for some patients with bulbar palsy, a lung volume recruitment manoeuvre and a manually assisted cough is more effective than MIE. I've certainly found that this in my practice and I'm reassured that giving up on MIE in favour of LVR is not a bad thing and sometimes can work out better to help their cough, especially if um, reflective cough is maintained better than cough to command. So I think that that's just a comment and it is important to point out that there's a toolbox. Um, there was a sort of, I noticed a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about um, on Twitter, the use of MIE based on a recent publication, potentially to, to prevent aspiration to clear food and using it afterwards. And whilst this is not something I outwardly go and tell patients to do, I have had patients feed back to me that they've adopted this and that they've been absolutely fine. How have you had any experience also in this area. I saw that and it was interesting. Uh, I agree totally. Uh, they uh, they included six patients where one of them was ALS patient and I, I couldn't see how the ALS patient was the ALS patient also doing that or was that other neuromuscular patients. But we have neuromuscular patients who feel that if they <clears throat> get the um, food, <laughs> food uh, aspirated, uh, they have one cough program to <laughs> get it out. So it's, it's used by somebody, uh, someone, uh, uh, several patients, but not like routine. Uh, we don't recommend it that routinely, but if they say it's a big problem, we can say, okay, you can try it how it is, because it can be worse as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, interesting, definitely. Uh, that should have uh, more focus. Okay, thank you, Tina. Thank you, Michelle. I think we have answered all the questions. I want to thank you very much, Tina, for uh, another interesting and amazing presentation on how to use uh, MIE in the best possible way for the patients with ALS.